We are very fortunate to have with us this afternoon a panel of runway safety experts. Here to moderate this panel is ALPA's Airport and Ground Environment Group Chair, Captain Jeff Sedin. Good afternoon and welcome. Um, I am Captain Jeff Sedin with the United Airlines, the uh, chairperson of the uh, ALPA Airport and Ground Environment Group. Um, recently, there's been a lot of talk in the news about runway incursions. That's where there's uh, either an aircraft or vehicle on a runway um, without permission or two aircraft in close proximity to each other. Are these incidents increasing in um, frequency or are they just being reported more often? Assembled here are the experts that are working around the clock tirelessly to um, eliminate these threats to aviation uh, safety. Scott Proudfoot with the uh, federal, uh, the FAA, our runway safety manager. He's been a controller since 1992. He's been uh, with the runway safety uh, group since uh, 2020 and uh, the co-chair of the Runway Safety Council. Bridget Singret Nakul, Nakul, hope I pronounced it close. Good enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone just knows her as uh, Bridget in, uh, the, in the Washington. Uh, runway, uh, the uh, NACA runway safety representative. She's been a controller at the uh, DFW Tower. She co-chairs the uh, Runway Safety Council along with uh, Scott. And she uh, also holds a uh, commercial uh, multi-engine instrument rating. Keith Wisniewski, uh, Chicago Hare. He's the uh, general manager of uh, airfield operations. He a, a, was a former U.S. Air Force KC-135 crew, crew chief and a Desert Storm veteran. He's been working um, for 30 years on, uh, uh, at O'Hare in um, uh, airport operations. Next to him is um, Captain Robert Devin Dowson, uh, JetBlue uh, A320 captain. Uh, he's been uh, a, the uh, Washington National ASL since uh, 2018, and he's uh, this year's ASL of the Year Award recipient. Uh, thank you all for being here. From your perspective, what are, what are you and your organization doing to maintain, the, uh, maintain or increase the uh, current level of safety when operating within the uh, movement area? Scott, we'll go with you first. All right, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, congratulations on your award also. Thank you. Um, so from an FAA perspective, uh, we start small at the local level and we branch out to the national level when we look for uh, trends and risk in the uh, surface environment. So at the local level, we have our runway safety action team meetings, RSAT meetings, you may hear them called. And every airport, of the 526 controlled tower airports that we collect our data from is required to have at least one annual RSAT meeting every uh, fiscal year. So at the local level, we can learn about issues that are going on at the RSAT. It's a chance for all users to come together, talk about safety issues, talk about trends that are at that airport, and figure out mitigations on how to combat those. When you work up, we have uh, regional runway safety program managers. Those, those individuals operate in the regions. We have nine regions across the United States. And those individuals work with their airports to look for trends that are, may be occurring on a regional level. And then, as Jeff said, we work with the Runway Safety Council, the Surface Safety Group. Bridget and I work together at the headquarters level along with some other individuals. And we look for trends that are going on nationally. And we hold these groups just like um, RSAT meetings. They're on a bigger scale. They have individuals represented from all types of industry and government leaders that have an interest in surface safety. And we come together on a quarterly basis to talk about risk in the NAS. And we identify risk, we identify trends, and we come up with mitigations as a group to eliminate those or at least reduce those. They could be via procedure changes, um, letters of agreements, training, uh, mandatory briefing items, anything that would uh, help in reducing those issues. Thank you. Bridget? 
Let me step back a little bit. So do you guys have any idea of how many takeoff and landings we have in the national airspace system every year? I see a lot of shaking heads. Last year, we had 52 and a half million. You should be proud. So there's, what else do I see in that number? 52 and a half million. That's two, 52 and a half million opportunities for some type of failure to take place. How many runway incursions did we have? 1,730. Everybody in this room is under pressure. All of you have to be 100%, 100% of the time, just like the people I represent. That 1,730, we always need to strive for zero, right? Always strive for zero. But the element of that is that number doesn't really change. So I can go back 10, 15 years from now, or past, 10 or 15 years, and that number is going to change maybe by 100 or 200. What does that show you? What I'm trying to say to you is that you're doing exceptional at your job. Our NAS is extremely safe. One of the things that I pushed for, there was an NTSB runway incursion forum a couple months ago. It was mentioned earlier. One of the big things that I mentioned was technology. Scott mentioned there's 526 towered airports out there. Guess how many have surface surveillance? 43. I venture to say you guys fly into more than 43 airports. The more tools that we give controllers, the more tools that we give pilots, the better off we are. Technology has proven to reduce the severity of a runway incursion. There's 20 hour airports out there that have runway status lights out of 43. In order to have runway status lights, you have to have surface surveillance at this point in time. Both of those are exceptional tools, not only for controllers to know the situational awareness, a better picture of situational awareness, but also for pilots to have better situational awareness when, with regards to runway status lights. It's kind of sad that I can say that general aviation aircraft that are taxiing around right now have better situational awareness displays than I do. So we have to work harder and keep pushing to get different technologies, not only to the controllers, but to you guys as well. Keith? Oh, thanks, Jeff. Um, again, for us airfield operations, like all our airport operators um, in this NAS system, runway safety is our number one priority. Uh, we are out there every day at O'Hare, 24-7, 365, with our staff, inspecting runways, making sure Part 139 compliance is maintained, adhered to, and looking for other advancements to increase the Part 139 presence. That goes along with the lighting systems, the markings, the maintenance, the patching, the grooving. All of our runways are grooved. Uh, the rubber removal, happens over here approximately six to seven times a year, friction coefficients. We work and attack it at many different levels. We increased our operations staff to, so we have better, more eyes on the runways and taxiways to meet our compliance. Runways are inspected primarily at night, with up to two hours. During the daytime, during a light, light, daytime light run down the runway to check for any obvious deficiencies. Also, we have weekly one-hour daylight inspections with all hands on deck to drive the runway, be on the runway safely, closed, of course. And our guys are annotating everything to put all these work orders in to keep up with all of our pavement that we have. O'Hare has really increased its safety for runway safety. When we went to the parallel runway system as we completed um, the O1P in 2021. Again, our primary east-west flows for O'Hare three arrival runways, two departure runways. That gives O'Hare's operation right now. We can handle, if the man is there, 114 arrivals in the hour, along with 82 departures in that same hour. Right now, daily, we are still below the pre-pandemic levels, but we're averaging about 950 operations each of arrivals and departures. So then prior pandemic, pre-pandemic, we were about 2,400. So we're inching back to that. Along with that, we have a lot of construction that goes on in the airfield that we monitor. 
We just finished out building Terminal 5, adding on gates. We are now working for enabling work going on on the west side of the airfield to get the footprints ready to build the additional terminals and rebuild our Terminal 2. That has challenges with taxiways primarily now. Runways are complete. But working with Jeff and Elpa, we worked on a lot of initiatives with him, uh, i.e. getting Pappy lights to all of our runways. We are still in the process of finishing a project, um, getting Pappies, changing geometries, so complex geometries to runways, from runways. We are mitigating those. So we're looking at several different ways for our, our normal daily daylight operation. Also, a big part of our world is the winter operations. We have snow in Chicago, if you haven't heard. <laughs> um, last year's relatively light. But we were looking at a lot of initiatives for runway safety, of getting on the runways fast, being out there, getting you guys FICONs, the most relevant FICON data, not being old. We do it in several ways. One methodology is PI reps that we receive from the pilots. We know a nil triggers a closed runway for an assessment. We've also initiated, if we are monitoring, well, we are monitoring the arrival runways, and when we hear two poor braking actions by two consecutive airport aircraft on a runway, that triggers us to send someone to that runway, and we call it a critical runway assessment, where we talk with tower, anybody within five miles is still cleared to land, anybody outside of five miles is get sent around, and we will get an assessment down the runway to see what why they're calling pours. It might be we can't find an anomaly. It might be a slick spot because of the ice or fluid. Many different reasons. We will then either update the FICON, or we will then close the runway for mitigation by treatment and or removal. <laughs> Lastly, we initiated a timer situation. There's only two airports that I know of that operate this. It's O'Hare and Detroit does a modification of it. We had a year, about five, six years ago, we had three runway excursions in a season. That's a trend, that's an alarm. It was on our runway nine left two seven right, our north runway, 7,500 feet. We were trying to get to the runway, ATC at no fault to them. They want to keep pumping planes in. We had a supervisor, at the threshold of the runway, wanting to get down the runway to check out why pilots are starting to call pours. Poor, 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 but they're landing and they're turning off. We didn't get out there because they, they go, we have five more in line. Okay, we're gonna get the five more in line, we'll get you down the runway. One goes down, two goes down, three, off the runway. We triggered out two pours now to get us out there. We call it a critical wrong assessment to get that checked on. That's very big. Then we added in now snow. What's happened with snow? We know snow is changing the airfield as it's coming down. We put a matrix together, as you see on the screen. So when we have dry snow falling, and we use our weather systems to say what the field has coming down at that time, we put timers on. Timers are set to each runway. OK, at the beginning, every runway we have, all eight, will start the timer on it. We then are obligated for our snow and ice control plan to reassess that runway within 120 minutes. If that timer runs out, that runway's closed. So that, with the work with ATC, we then start staggering those assessments, depending on what flow we're in and the demand of that runway, if it's an arrival demand, a departure demand, to start staggering the timers. That has given us better eyes of what's going on at the runway for a treatment or a cleaning. It's also giving you a, bit, a fresh FICON to put in your system with the RCAM matrix. It's keeping up with that. Um, I've heard in the past industry from some of our airports, they don't up their FICONs until the snow ends. They don't up the FICON until they get a nil report. In my mind, that's not good. So we developed this matrix with a lot of many years of personnel on our panel to say what numbers should we put to what conditions of snow and ice. This is what we came up with. It's working for us right now. There's pros to us on my side. There's pros to us, I believe, in this community here. But then again, some people say it slows the engine down because we get to get out there, check the runway. And that checking that runway could be just reissuing another FICON because the conditions are met for closure. And the new numbers of the friction value are not conditions to put it into 
a 222 or 333. Or as a lot of our controllers and our experience has shown that we've had wet snow, moderate, and 45 minutes getting out there again, we know that last third is probably going to be bad. Because again, planes are taking off those long runways, they're coming down, that kinetic energy, they're turning off, but no one's hitting that last third. So everybody's pre-planned. And these timers are not just within my office, they're on the web, Tower has them for anticipating or work with us, the Tracon has them, and all of our airline carriers have them. So that way, everybody's seeing what's going on. And we use the Aerobond system, and for all of our major players at O'Hare, and we're tracking it that way on our side uh, of where our teams are at and what we're doing and what the expectations. We were tasked several years ago in our snow program, give us predictability. And we found that this is one of the measures we could work on predictability and also giving you, the flying community, a heads up of what the payment is looking like. Um, that's what I have for right now, Jeff. Thank you, Keith. Robert? I want to take a minute to, I didn't get a chance to say anything after receiving the, the award from the association, but I'm, I'm truly honored to be, have been nominated and then have received this ASL award. Um, you know, my volunteerism with the association dates back to when I was a young pilot with TWA, walking the halls of Congress, wearing out soles of shoes, trying to advance the cause for some of the, one cause, at least for the association and its pilots. So thank you all for that. Uh, that award. I'm very grateful for that. Um, with regards to your question, I'm not going to get as granular, Jeff. Uh, I see that the food coma is starting to put some of you to sleep. So in respect of pilots having short attention spans, I'll keep it relatively broad. Um, I would say that, you know, I represent the association. I represent pilots that are member pilots of, of ALPA. Uh, to that end, you know, I'm one of hundreds of airport safety liaisons. My area of expertise, if you want to call it that, is, is Washington National uh, Airport. In, uh, it's technically in Arlington, Virginia, but we call it the nation's capital airport. Um, in any case, what I strive to do as the ASL for that airport is work with the close-in ASLs, Dulles, BWI, and foster that relationship with both not just the airport manager and management, but with the local air traffic controllers there in the control tower. And you know, we have discussed over the last five years or so, you know, resurfacing projects that Jeff alluded to, uh, runway lighting, um, airfield construction, um, even some of the terminal things that pilots care about, jetway operation and so forth. Um, so to that end, as a, as a member of the association representing the pilots that are the end users, and it, it may surprise you that not every airport manager, uh, O'Hare, of course, is an exception, but they don't always want the pilots involved with the process, which, which to me sounds crazy, because we're the end user. Uh, we're not directly paying the taxes, but we're force multipliers on behalf of the airline we fly for. You know, you bring 100 people in, 200 people into an airport, those people go into the terminal, they use the services. We're bringing them in and out of that airport. Um, so, with respect to your question, um, as far as the movement area is concerned, it's a variety of projects covering a variety of topics, but anything affecting the pilots, I'm there to represent the pilots and discuss those things with the stakeholders. Thank, thank you, Robert. And now, you and all the other ASLs are, are the ones that see these issues, not just with um, airport operations, the, the uh, security, TSA, working with the controllers, which we, I think we have a great relationship with. Um, you know, all, all across, you know, the board, we are the, um, you know, we're the go-to guys and girls that are, are there that hopefully we have build up the relationships with the uh, airport community that they know to call us if there's an issue um, out there or if they want our feedback. Thank you. I'll start with you, Bridget. What, what, can, what can we do from your opinion as a controller? You can tell the pilots or, you know, or you, you as a controller, uh, what can we do today to increase this level of safety um, in, the, in the movement areas that, uh, that we're having issues with lately? So the risk of a runway incursion is always present. Right? There's people who are always landing and there's people who are always departing. There's aircraft and tugs and airport vehicles that are always moving around the airfield, right? So that element of risk will always be there. From a controller's perspective, I almost 
feel silly in saying this, but it's just the, the back to basics type component. So I don't know the last, we're finally opening up facilities for different tours, right? So if you haven't been to an air traffic control tower or into an approach control, I'd highly recommend doing so. One of the things that you'll notice with a control tower is that what you might think is the most minute element, the movement of a flight strip, the work, a little check mark on a pad of paper. Each of those pieces means something to me, but it not only means something to me, it means something to the, everybody else in the tower cab. So I come out of, I'm out of DFW. I like to say we push a decent amount of aircraft, right? When I first became an air traffic controller and prior to, I always thought that air traffic control had all the coolest gadgets out there, right? It's like CSI Miami, you know? <laughs> it's not necessarily like that. I mentioned earlier, only 43 out of the 526 airports have surface surveillance. Even at DFW, I use flight strips. Okay, so if I'm working ground control, I need to make sure that my local controller or tower has those strips in order if not, I'll be hearing about it, right? When I'm on local control, if I clear somebody for takeoff, I slide the strip. If I put somebody in lineup and wait, and I'm crossing downfield, I flip the strip over. <laughs> you see where I'm getting here? The simplest procedure helps in the reduction of the likelihood of a runway incursion. The other piece of that is that the entire team around me knows what I'm doing without me even saying it. Procedures are in place for those types of reasons. So when you continue to strive, keep those procedures, make sure that we're working together, not only as individuals, but more of that crew resource management piece. Thank you, Bridget. Keith, any, anything on the uh, airport operations side that you see that would help, um, you could pass along to the pilots that helps you um, keep the, main, the uh, movement area safe. Again, um, for our perspective is airport operations and being boots on the ground, vehicles on the ground. We always want the light nav aids, everything to be working for everybody in the fire pilot industry. We want that for flying. Signage, marking, sliding to be clean, one. Two, when we can, with our projects, change geometries, we're complex. And we have some areas where we mitigate in the future. Three is, like you might say, back to basics, training. Um, we have a vendor service that trains all of our personnel that get access to the airfield that have driving privileges to use the service roads, to use the ramps. We have three levels, I'll keep it clean. We have advance for six groups of people that have to work in a taxiway environment for their normal jobs. That's airport operations, that's our fire department, our motor truck drivers that do snow and do escorting, USDA wildlife, FAA tech apps, and I'm missing one more, I forgot the sixth one, um, but six groups there. Then we have another group that we train. That's the taxi mechanics. That could be either driving the super tugs or taxiing the aircraft themselves. They must go through our training program along with their airline training program. Those two groups are trained annually um, to keep fresh in what's going on with the airfield and all of our changes as O'Hare has. Now if you've seen, since we started the OMP, we have partly a charting cycle chains and O'Hare's Jepson chart every 56 days. That makes it real complex to keep up with. Our service also puts out blast alerts to all of our users on the ground of these changes that when they happen, because we don't look at Jepson charts. They don't look at Jepson charts. Lastly is our biggest group, which are basic driving privileges that drive the service roads, your ground caterers, your GSC going out. And that group there, we have approximately 21,000 people that get the yellow stripe. Training, training, training from their groups of that they give training, from our driver's manual for the training they should have there and take tests on, and then going through our vendor training to keep up with it. For tech for runway, runway incursions, that's a main topic for us. Also in the industry right now is vehicles cutting off aircraft. We need to get this training out. We have not found any good trends as of yet of a location on the airport that's challenging. 
Um, some people have thought that it might be post-pandemic, everybody's hiring brand new people, and they're all not getting enough training and they're young. That is not shown to be the case, because when we do identify the people and bring them in and talk, we get their story. How long have you worked for the company? What training have you had? And it varies from six months to 30 years. So we haven't found any really good trend yet, but we are tracking and monitoring and trying to find where we could stop all this. But again, that training of them, them knowing what the runway environment is. When we started the program with our vendor company, it was unique because they would put questionnaires out to everybody that's going through because we make it all in person. We did go hybrid for the pandemic due to what was going on, so we went virtual, but with, with a live instructor. So you're not sitting at a thing that's hitting, clicking through, and then I get a certificate. These are live instructors. You must attend. You must be there. And they quiz you through the course of a couple hours. Then we ask them, what have you learned? What have you found out? We found people that have been with the airport 20, 30 years. They have no idea. They never knew what a wigwag lay was, an RGL. So they were getting education there. Don't go across those. That's not for you. Um, we've also helped out to keep them on service roads. If you taxi through here, at all of our service road crossings, we put two amber lights for the vehicles, and that's for the winter operation. When the snow gets covered and that vehicle's got to get across and you see a sea of lights, where's my target? Keep it between the four blue lights, yellow lights, amber. So we work at a lot of many different levels to keep the vehicles where they should be. And that's our goal to do that, to prevent runway incursions at this time and for overall safety. Is that up, Jeff? Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you said that number of 21,000 because you, you asked a lot of people how many people have driving privileges. Oh, maybe 200 or something like that. But you know, 21,000 people are licensed or eligible to drive at O'Hare. That's a big number there. Robert? Now, you'd asked about airport operations, Chef, but just rephrase the question, if you would. It... Um, what, what can we do, you being an, a, a great ASL, working with the airports, what, what can you tell the pilots here as a way to help um, them make sure they stay off the movement area and or pass the word along if there's an issue to the controllers yeah. or airport operations? So this is a multifaceted problem. I, I just had a, I was attending the RSAT at Washington uh, National and one of their issues they're having, it's a very compact, close-in city airport. But with markings wearing out, um, a variety of pilot experiences coming in and out of there. You know, you've got a whole regional terminal on the north side of the airport. In many cases, the average flight time of those pilots will be lower, less experienced pilots. Um, you, on occasion, you'll have otherwise experienced pilots flying into the airport for the first time. So if you've got non-standard markings or lighting, uh, as has happened, I've read a few of the NASA ASRS reports, and there is something involving um, a mix-up in the communication either from the tower or from the pilots, all of a sudden you're, you have a much greater threat of the, a runway incursion. And that is on the mind of the airport manager and the, and the tower supervisors there at National now. So for the pilots that are out here, which is most of you, um, be extra vigilant. There are a lot of pressures. Uh, Ms. Fox spoke about it at the beginning of the the presentations about external pressures and so forth. Most of you know the Swiss cheese model of accident and incident prevention. Um, and it's, it's still true and it may be more acute in a post-COVID world where pilots have a little bit less experience um, or unfamiliarity. Uh, and that is, consider the pressures that you may not even be thinking about. The pressure by your company to do a single engine taxi. Sure, you want to conserve fuel when it's necessary, but don't take that to the nth degree where all of a sudden you're compromising safety both of you heads down at a very critical time, missing a whole short line, missing a taxiway turnoff. At a close-in airport, certainly National is, is uh, like this, I think Chicago Midway, even a large airport like, like Boston Logan, you know, you miss one turnoff and the entire airport almost has to come to a stop because the flow is completely upended. So be extra vigilant, take the time, and, and don't be afraid to just slow down a little bit. Um, if it prevents a runway incursion or something worse, uh, then you've done your job correctly. Great, great advice. You know, take it, you know, if need be, slow down. Now, Scott, from your point of view, from the runway safety office, or as you know, what you've seen in your you know, uh, almost 30 years as a controller. I would talk about uh, expectation bias. 
Um, we see a lot of incidents between controllers and pilots where a controller issues a clearance and a pilot reads back what they thought they were going to hear or they read back what the controller said but performed in an action in what they thought the clearance they were going to receive was. So my advice to pilots, this group and all pilots, is to just listen very carefully as to what the controller is telling you and make sure that you act in accordance with the clearance that you received. And don't cross the hold line until you're sure that you have a clearance on that runway. Bridget mentioned the numbers from fiscal year 22. What she didn't mention, she didn't go too deep into, was the number of pilot deviations in those numbers is 62% from FY22 of those 1,730 events. 62% are rated towards the pilot deviation side. When you break those down a little further, 77% on your general aviation. So you have 23% where commercial carriers were involved in pilot deviations in FY22. And then we'll go on to show you that the most common occurrence to a runway incursion, the, the most common reason, is just crossing the hold line. You cross the hold line without a clearance. And if we could get pilots to recognize the hold line in front of them and to not cross it without a clearance due to whatever reason, we'd reduce runway incursions. It sounds simple, but we have a hard time getting that message out to the pilots. I just to inter Thanks, Jack. Scott. Yeah, just for a second. To that uh, point, Scott, appreciate you bringing that up because um, nothing warms a pilot's heart more than when we ask for a clarification and the controller says, appreciate you double checking. <laughs> because that just means it reinforces the idea that, hey, we don't want anything to happen either. We don't want the phone call. We don't want certificate action. So if it helps everybody all around, I think that uh, that's something pilots love to hear. Thank you, Scott. Bridget. Keith and Robert for being on this panel. I think um, it was very informative to the members to hear the different point of view from the FAA's runway safety, the, the tower, the controllers, the airports, and just another pi pilot on, uh, that's working on safety. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you.